This presentation is available for MCLE self-study credit. If you would like to receive credit, you must take three actions. First, click the show more text below on our YouTube page. The text will expand and show a link to download the handout materials. Once you finish watching this presentation, please click the quiz link to receive self-study credit. Once the quiz is successfully completed, you will receive a certificate via email within 72 hours. We hope you enjoy the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. For those of you who are just tuning in, my name is Hayward Cho, and I am the General Manager of ADR Services, Inc. I am also your MC and host for today. Uh, before we move on to the next program, I would like to briefly remind you of uh, several housekeeping items. Uh, your written materials are available at adrservices.com. I will also post it on the chat function uh, periodically during the presentation. Your CLE certificates will be sent via email by end of day tomorrow. You do not need to sign in. Your attendance is captured through Zoom. The programs are recorded and will be made available for self-study MCLE credit on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can attend some or all programs today and claim credit for any that you attend. Please send me your questions through the, through the Q&A function. And for any technical questions, please feel free to email us at mcle at adrservices.com. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Please allow me to introduce our next speaker, the Honorable Craig Carlin, who will present on Law in Motion, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, a perspective from the bench. So Judge Carlin's extensive experience includes 14 years as an independent calendar courtroom judge, managing up to 730 cases simultaneously with precision. As the West District probate judge for eight years, he showcased exceptional acumen in handling high net worth probate cases with complex financial matters and emotionally charged fam familial dynamics. Since his uh, first mandatory settlement conference in 2003, Judge Carlin has been dedicated to facilitating fair and reasonable outcomes, handling thousands of MSCs in various civil actions, including probate. His expertise as a settlement officer has not only resolved his cases, but also those of his bench colleagues. Now available as a mediator, arbitrator, and referee, Judge Carlin continues his commitment to dispute resolution. Judge Carlin's program today will be interactive, so please keep your eyes peeled for some polls throughout the presenta uh, presentation and test our knowledge of, of law in motion. Judge Carlin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hayward. So just, just to be precise, I've handled thousands and thousands and thousands of cases, um, over 100 mediations in the last year alone, and, and I've lost track of how many MSCs. I don't think I've handled thousands of MSCs. Just wanna be fair for everybody and, and uh, be accurate. Most importantly though, thank you for being there. Uh, thank you for all of you who have joined in to listen to this today. I promise you that you will get something out of this. You will learn something you didn't know. Uh, we're gonna have some little fun tests today. And I, if the, my uh, guess is right, not everybody will get these questions right. Um, I also wanna thank real quickly, Katie Jones for putting together this amazing PowerPoint and Andrea Niven, uh, who was my research attorney at the LA Superior Court. And I am grateful as an ADR services uh, for not only helping me with the content, um, but making sure everything was accurate again and again and again. And of course, last but not least, Team Chelsea, who does everything for me here, Chelsea Mangle and Morgan and Casey. Um, let me get right to it. I sat in the West District of the Los Angeles County Superior Court. For those of you who are not from Los Angeles, the best way that I can describe the West District is it's where Jed Clampett arrived after he struck oil in the Beverly Hillbillies. It is certainly one of the wealthier districts in Los Angeles, if not the state of California. It includes Bel Air, where the Beverly Hillbillies was, Beverly Hillbillies, Hillbillies. Am I saying that right? Was filmed. Uh, Beverly Hills, Holmby Hills, Brentwood, Santa Monica and many other wonderful, amazing communities, Culver City, I know I'm leaving some out. Um, Malibu, it is a very high rent uh, community, which means wonderful lawyers, really highly litigated cases. Um, 
as a judge, it was amazing because I felt like I was going back to law school every day. So one of the benefits is we had a lot of high value cases with incredible lawyers and a ton of law in motion because the people in the West District can afford it. So um, that's what I'm here to help you with today, the things that I garnered for the bench in my 20 year career. So let's get right to it. Next slide, Katie. Formatting. Um, font, Courier, Times, New Roman, or Arial. Arial this is Court of Rules, uh, Rule of California Rules of Court, Rule 2, 100. It, it does matter. And I know to you, sometimes so there are lawyers out there who think, this is so boring. It's always the same font. But to someone in my position or my former position who had to read hundreds, if not thousands of pages every single week, having Times New Roman was wonderful. Courier, Arial, they're all fine. They're all easy on my eye. 12 point font double spaced matters. If it's squeezed in, if you go from the, uh, if you try to get 30 lines per page, it's brutal. Just the extra couple lines can make it very difficult. So please think about this because the way the motion is presented, as simple and obvious as this is, it really can impact my ability to read it. Um, if you're the fourth motion that I'm reading when I was going through multiple motions in an evening, and this one has a different font, and it's got a different size, and it's got too many lines per page, um, and then, of course, we have page limits. It's got too many pages. It makes it very difficult to get your message across. So please be mindful that following these rules helps us as a court, uh, as me as a former judge, it helps me to easily read these without getting a headache. Next slide. Same thing in terms of page limit. This is an interesting one on length. Um, every now and then someone would come in and they would ask for more pages. And oftentimes I would grant it. I can tell you though, rarely did it seem to help the person who asked for extra pages. Um, most winning arguments can be made pretty succinctly. And there isn't a need to string cite 40 cases. There isn't a need to give me every word verbatim from a case. If there's a case on point, tell me what the case is. It's on point, Judge. This is why we win. And I promise you that I will read it. And I know that my former colleagues from the bench in the West District where I sit, sat would do and will do the same. So be mindful of page lengths. Shorter is better. Never got upset someone who came in and brought me a four-page motion. Judge, I'm really embarrassed. I know I had 10 pages. I only used four of them. Are you upset? Upset would not be the right word. Um, ecstatic, um, joyous. There are a lot of better words for that, especially if it's well-written. Um, it does not mean that you are going to lose because you didn't use your 10 pages. Objections. Please be mindful of CR3 Rule 3.1354, which sets forth how written objections to uh, MSJs are to be uh, presented. And a lot of times judges will use that for other motions like slap motions. So I think we have a question here, Katie. We have our first one. There we go. Question for everybody. Take a look at that question. Let's see if I can get everybody to answer. True or false, the court is required to consider your objections in conjunction with a motion for summary judgment, even though they do not comply with the formatting rules, 3.1354. I still, when I was sitting on the bench, would have an obligation to rule, to consider your objections and rule on them. Is that true or false? Give you about 30 seconds, then we're going to move on. It says, oh, it says, I don't get to vote. Host and panelists can't vote. That's too bad. Katie, we got answers? How many said? Let's, let's move on. Do we have enough voting? Okay, but how many voted? Do we have a result? Yes, it looks like we have 43% participation, 31% said true, and 69% said false. Okay. 
So congratulations. 31% of you learned something today. I, my job is 31% of the way there. Um, the answer is false. I do not have to rule when the when the objections are not in the proper format. And most of my colleagues won't um, because it's really hard to, it's like searching for Waldo is the nicest way I could put it. If you follow the format, ruling on the objections is simple. If you don't, it can be really difficult and problematic. Um, and that's why oftentimes I would just say, I don't have the time to search through this. I have other motions and other people who need me to read their stuff. So um, the law is false. Next page. Timing in general, just be aware that moving papers, everybody knows 16 court days, opposing uh, court, opposing docs, nine court days before the hearing, reply papers, five court days before the hearing. If you miss those deadlines, the court can disregard them. So please be mindful. Um, on motions for summary judgment, hold on, go back one second. On motions for summary judgment adjudication, the deadlines have slightly different language also, not less than 14 calendar days before the hearing for opposition, not less than five calendar days for the reply, and at least 75 days before the motion hearing. Um, okay, so you'll have this a link that tells you all the info. If the due date, here's a question for you, if the due date for a summary judgment motion falls on a weekend or a holiday is the filing deadline extended to the next monday or the next court day so to speak so again falls on either a weekend or if the monday is a holiday does it get extended to the next court day on a weekend it would be a monday if the monday is a holiday then it would be a tuesday yes or no does it get extended the deadline for filing And before we give, Katie, can we flip it and you tell me the results of the vote and then we'll tell them the answer? It's a little more fun. Let me see. Um, I can tell you the results of the vote. It was 58% um, yes, 42% no. And we had just about 50% participation. Well done, everybody. So I am getting closer to the finish line. I told you that you would all learn something. 58% of you said yes, it moves to the next Monday or the court day. Is that right, Katie? Correct. What's the answer? Let's show the slide. Oh, let's, can we take that down or does everyone say that or just me? There we go. The answer is no, it does not move. Statutes which extend the time with which an act must be completed by one day when the last day to perform the act falls on a Sunday or a holiday do not extend the time for an act that must be performed not less or not later than a given number of days before a designated time. This is one of those rare exceptions. Um, most of you were probably thinking um, for trials and for preference and things of that nature. But when the statute says, as in the motion for summary judgment statutes, the time within it must be completed, you don't get the extension. So there's the case, 58% um, of you I'm 42% I'm of the way now from getting home. Next one. Here is one of my favorite um, on summary judgment. The court, as you probably all know, cannot shorten the 75 day notice period for summary judgment or adjudication or, uh, without the party's consent. CCP 437 CA gives the court the power to shorten time on other summary judgment time requirements, but not on the 75 day notice of hearing. So let's go forward. So for example, um, I'll skip over because we're, I want to get through all these true or false. The 75 day notice period can be shortened by the trial court in cases where trial preference has been granted. So in case, Hold on before we vote. As you probably all know, preference requires the court to hear the case within 120 days. Almost impossible if preference is granted early, the pleadings aren't at issue yet to get your motion heard. So many judges believe 
that it's a preference. Preference statute, getting this to trial, takes precedence over the MSJ statute, and therefore, we're going to have to shorten, shorten the notice. True or false, the 75-day notice period can be shortened by the trial court in case, cases where trial preference has been granted. Um, what do you think? Can the court do that? True or false? And again, Katie, once we have enough votes in about 10 seconds, can you tell me the results before we give the answer? Yes, I can, Judge Carlin. It looks like we have about 50% participation here, and we're sitting at 38% true and 62% false. Okay, so before you give the answer, I used to think that the 38% was the right answer because it didn't make sense that you couldn't shorten the notice period when you're in a preference kind of, um, I like to call that, it's not even a hundred yard dash. Those of you who are from the East Coast, indoors they have the 60 yard dash or 60 meter dash. That's what it's like. It's one of the most frenetic things you'll ever do. And the answer, Katie, is, was I right? I was oh. wrong. Oh, my goodness. My instincts were wrong. And every time I said it, luckily, I didn't do it or get reversed, reversed. But you cannot do that. And in fact, there's a case right on point that says you can't do it. Um, next slide. Service of motions. Um, be aware of your local rules. The LA County Superior Court um, has mandated electronic service. And if you read California Rule of Court, Rule 2.251, it does talk about each of the courts making that determination. So I know this is a statewide presentation. Please check your local rules to find out if your court has mandated it. Um, next slide. If your e-file discovery motion is rejected by the clerk's office, will your filing, okay, again, if you're timely, I'm going to add one word to this question. If your timely e-file discovery motion is rejected by the clerk's office, will your filing be de deemed timely? So you timely file it, but it's rejected. Will it nevertheless be deemed timely? Everybody follow? You electronically file it, clerk, it rejects it. Is it nevertheless timely? Mm -hmm. We're sitting pretty even here, Judge Carlin. We have 45% yes and 55% no. I should get, Katie, do we have the option to let people re-vote? Um, I don't think they can change their vote once they submit. But All right. Done that. Okay, so we're going to go to the answer. To the 45% of you who said yes, that it will be timely filed, check out the answer. Congratulations, you were right. Let me just throw another question out, Katie. Before we go to the next slide, I'm just thinking about something. We're talking about discovery. What about your complaint? Because I've had this issue come up with fax filing and other times. Now that we're at e-filing, what if you file your complaint and hypothetically, for whatever reason, it is on the last day of the statute of limitations? And what if it gets rejected by the clerk's office? Will it nevertheless be deemed timely filed? Can we add that question to everyone? Yes, let me pop it up here. So if your e-filed complaint is rejected by the clerk's office, will it nevertheless be deemed filed as the date electronically submitted? Yes, life is good. I can sleep tonight. No, O-M-G. This is bad. And our feedback is coming in. Uh, the yeses have 57% and the noes have 43. Okay. So for the yeses, again, check out the answer. Mm. You Do know, I don't, have have the, I don't have the answer put in on this one on the fly. You'll have to tell okay. us the answer, Ms. Garland. Let's go to the next slide. I think it's there. Avoid this pitfall. California Rule of Court, Rule 2.259C regarding delayed delivery does not apply to the filing of a complaint or any other initial pleading in an action or proceeding. 
That means those who said yes, you're not going to be sleeping well. The answer is no. So be really careful on those last minute electronic filings of complaints that satisfy the statute of limitations. Really big problem if it gets rejected. Okay. So um, hopefully that was worth the price of admission today. Do we have an admission price, Katie? <laughs> no, we don't. So <laughs> definitely worth it. <laughs> there, it was worth it. Okay. Um, here are some pleading motions. Um, there's a lot more for me to cover, so I'm really going to talk quickly. Um, Anti-slap motions. There are two interesting cases you could look at. Uh, Lefebvre versus Lefebvre, 199, Cal App 4th, 696. Olson versus Doe, 12 Cal 5th, 669. Um, why are they so interesting? Um, I was affirmed. Okay, that's, and they're interesting cases. On Demers, in Santa Monica, mm -hmm. about, about five years after we created the personal injury hub in Los Angeles County, the Demers grew to an astronomical, unmanageable load. There was a point in time where I had somewhere between 100 and 200 Demers pending. Um, they were being put out a year to two years. They were that bad in terms of how they were delaying and clogging up the calendar. Um, I mentioned Andre Nivian earlier. She was with the court at the time and and she and I, and when I say she and I, it was 80% her, maybe 90% and 10% me, spearheaded this, this effort to fix the problem. And we actually brought out extra research attorneys to the West District to try and catch up. It's still a problem even today. And I'll tell you more about how many cases there are in the West District a little bit later. But ADR Services has a rule that the demur must be dispositive, otherwise it's going to be overruled. The way I always looked at demurs is the complaint is supposed to apprise you of the basis of the claims against your client. And then I ask myself, if I read the complaint, which I would in every single demur complaint or cross complaint, is it intelligible or every now and then unintelligible? Um, is it barred by the statute of limitations on its face? Otherwise, I always wondered, what's the real reason for the demur? Um, usually it makes the plaintiff's case better because it highlights all their weaknesses. Um, it does delay everything, but it's something I'm going to throw out there. I could probably do a full presentation on demurs since that I probably have thousands of. But um, just be mindful that it will delay as will motions to strike. Um, Anti-slap motions I already gave you some really interesting cases. There's um, just a fascinating area. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, true or false. A plaintiff may file an amended complaint any time prior to or at the hearing before, immediately before the hearing on the demur. Give you about 20 seconds. True or false. A plaintiff may file an amended complaint any time prior to or at the hearing on the demur. All right, we're sitting at about 60% true and 40% false. Um, let's look at the answer. False. Oh, we can close that. So a, a party must file and serve the amended pleading no later than the date for filing an opposition to the demur or motion to strike. The opposition date. Now, can I tell you that a judge won't be happy that a new pleading has been filed? Oftentimes, yes. Sometimes, no. And what I mean by sometimes, no, if the new pleading is gobbledygook too, I wouldn't allow it and I would make my ruling because there's no point in just delaying everything for months and months and months and months. But yeah, be mindful of that rule. Next question or next page. True or false, detailed written correspondence. This is, okay, I'm interrupting myself, but this is one that I took more slack or heat from good lawyers on, lawyers who put a lot of work and effort into um, meet and confers. 
and I got more, what do they call them? Is it side eye or that look where people throw daggers at you? A judge once said that, that if he could capture my look and stare at him for the record, it would somehow resemble throwing knives at him. And I understood his comment later on when I became a judge because I got it for this. And so the question is, detailed written correspondence satisfies the meet and confer requirements for a demur as per code. True or false? Okay, answer. I mean, numbers. Yes, we are sitting high here with 75% false, 25% true. Oh, the 25% are the ones who are giving me the, the evil eye or whatever the eye is that, that I don't want to get from you. <laughs> Let's show the answer. So it's in person or by telephone. I've had wonderful lawyers write extremely detailed 10, 12, 15 page meet and confer letters. I think that's fine as long as you follow up, either have a coffee, which we know is not likely to happen, or have a telephone call, then you're fine. But it does require that last step of human contact. Um, so just be aware of that. So to the 75% of you, this appears to have been my easiest question of the day. Don't worry, they'll get harder. Next one. If a First Amendment complaint has been filed as a matter of right, with no demur pending, how many further amendments are allowed in response to subsequently filed demurs? This is the easiest question on here today. One, two, three, five, unlimited. How many new pleadings are allowed? Get your votes in, folks. We're uh... we're closing the polls. New Hampshire is ready to deliberate. All right, looking at some figures here for number for one, um, we have thirty-one percent, two, six percent, three, five percent, five, one percent, and unlimited fifty-six percent. Wait, did I start this, Katie, by saying this was my easiest question on the uh, whole thing today? You must have done the options are overwhelming, maybe. Okay. Answer. Three. Three more. That's the new law. I think we had 5%. About 5%, yep. Okay. So I got 5% less of you to full but it's not really fooling. It's to show you something that uh, even I probably didn't know. Okay, let's move on. Jurisdictional motions. Um, you are all aware of these. I'm very mindful of the time because I want to talk about actual briefs and, and um, argument. Each of these courses could be a one to three hour seminar, each of these alone. Um, so here they are. Let's move on. Filing an answer, demur, demur, and or motion to strike together with a motion to quash does not constitute a general appearance in the action. Be aware of that. Next page. True or false? If the issue of lack of subject matter jurisdiction is not raised at the outset of the case, it is waived. True or false? I'm going to tell you this is the hardest question on the survey, on the quiz here. Are you just trying to walk back against the last answers? Yes. I'm trying to use some Jedi mind tricks so that everyone will get this right. Mm, using some anchor bias, as everybody learned about in the bias program a moment ago. I was, using, um, I was using the force, as everybody learned about from Luke Skywalker years ago. <laughs> All right, we have some numbers for you, Judge Carlin. We have true at 37% and false at 63%. Okay, the answer is false. Never, never waived. 
Next question. Next page. Okay. So I look at this page and I see most of my ex party calendar. Um, sometimes these are truly emergencies. There have been TROs that I had to address immediately. Writs of attachment, writs of possession. There were elder abuse cases where funds were being stolen. <laughs> Homes were about to be um, sold or quote stolen. I even had a stolen house case. Um, please, the one thing I, I urge you is please don't turn a non-emergency into an emergency. That happened a lot too, where, um, where I and my colleagues would scratch our heads and think this could have been dealt with weeks, months ago, and it wouldn't have been an emergency. Um, receivers, really, really important, um, useful tool in what we do for a living. Pick a good receiver and your life will be really happy. Um, and the right time to put a receiver in place is something that takes a lot of, of thought because if you put one in too early, it can blow everything up. If you wait too long, it can already be blown up. If you put the right receiver in at the right time, it can fix everything. It's just something to think about. And again, these would all be uh, great topics for some future presentation. Next page. Discovery motions. Everybody's familiar with the basics, motion to compel initial and further discovery responses. Here are your code sections, motion to quash, et cetera. Next page. <laughs> so unverified responses, we all know are tantamount to no, providing no response at all. What if, however, the response is hybrid, i.e., that is, it includes both responses and objections to demands and is unverified? Well, the propounding party is then entitled to an order compelling a verified response. Again, slightly different because objections to responses to inspection demands need not be verified. Therefore, the propounding party's failure to verify the document does not result in a waiver of the objections or render them untimely. Next page. Um, 45 days, most of you are aware of motion to compel further responses. One of the key interesting cases um, is golf and tennis pro shop, both unverified and um, both unverified and verified responses do not start the 45 day clock. Be aware of that. That was uh, brought to me by a lawyer's attention. Let's go to the next page. Code compliant responses. This was an issue that came up all the time. Um, use the code. Look at the code. Use the language that a diligent search and reasonable inquiry was made in an effort to comply. Um, follow the code 2031.230 and you'll make it a lot easier for you and everybody else. Next page. When it says be aware of SB 235, it doesn't mean beware. It just means understand and, and um, know that it is new in law as of January 1st, 2024. It lapses January 1st, 2027. What it does is it provides if requested. It's not self-executing. You have to actually make the request. It allows you to get a lot of information. And one of the ones that I deal with constantly today in mediations is people asking me, you know, what are the policy limits? Um, you can see on the fourth line there, that's one of the things that has to be turned over within the first 60 days. So very interesting provision. It adds a new section. If you want to write this down, CCP 2016.090, 2016.090, and it amends CCP 2023.050. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it has a mandatory $1,000 fine for violations. But there's a substantial justification escape clause for the court if the court finds there was substantial justification for noncompliance. Next slide. Motions for reconsiderations, be aware of this. Um, usually not done right, I hate to say it. There really has to be something new, different facts or law, uh, new or different facts, circumstances or law, and it's, it's hard to show that. Um, you could be one of those people where a case law came down and it wasn't um, finalized until after within two days or three days or five days. 
after the uh, the ruling came out, um, there may have been a, a discovery dump on you and you couldn't find a document. It, it's not that you, with reasonable diligence, um, how do I say it? It's not that, hey, judge, um, there's a document that I, I forgot to put in front of you or you know, there's more evidence I had. It's you've got to show with reasonable diligence that you wouldn't have been able to put this in front of me before. Um, let's move to the next one. If your motion is denied, can you seek the same relief later in a renewed motion? Everybody follow? You bring a motion, court denies it. Can you later bring a motion for the same relief? in a renewed motion. All right, we're getting some good participation here. It seems like the no's have it at about 60% and the yeses are sitting uh, at 37. You know what's great is the 3%. How do we not have 3%? <laughs> okay, the answer is not yes, it is no. Oh, excuse me. It is not, yes, hold on. I said that so backwards. Congratulations to the yes group. I'm going to leave it at that because I misspoke. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can bring a renewed motion. It must be based on new or different facts, circumstances, or law not previously considered by the court, but it must seek the same relief. Everybody follow? So let me rephrase what I said one more time. The answer is yes, you can bring a renewed motion. Um, I've been asked, can a different party bring a renewed motion? Well, if the initial ruling impacted or affected you, the answer is yes. Next slide. And here are the uh, tests for a CCP 10-1008B application to renew motion. Again, it's not subject to the 10-day filing limitation, period. So the real key here is have new facts new law, new something. Um, but so you can stay where we can move, go to 29. Here's just kind of the common sense. If let's say you bring your motion and there's no case on point and the court makes his ruling and then an appellate court or the Supreme Court comes down with a ruling that would have been dispositive, but you're beyond the 10 days. Um, you can bring a renewed motion or you can ask the court to reconsider on the court's own motion. And I would think that most trial courts would reconsider now that there's a court case, um, an appellate case right on point. So here are the court's ability <laughs> to renew, uh, to uh, reconsider. Can the court reconsider in other, excuse me, can the court reconsider or otherwise change a judgment once it's been entered? This one, I'm going to get 100% right. Can the court reconsider or otherwise change a judgment once entered? Katie, tell me once we get 100% of the people on the same same page here. Mm, I don't know if that's going to happen, Your Honor. We are sitting at 75% um, yes and 25% no. Hey, everyone who said no, raise your hands so I can see them. Yeah, that's the hard part about doing it this way. Um, raise your other hand, those who said no. And then Katie, give the answer. And the hands who were raised, clap each other. Good job. <laughs> After entry of judgment, the court cannot reconsider. You can bring a motion for a new trial. You can bring some other um, motion to vacate. You can bring some other remedies, but the court cannot reconsider. Next slide. Okay, so motions for summary judgment, motions for summary adjudication. Again, these are classes in and of themselves. Um, slide forward to the next slide. Here's some little interesting things about them. Can the court grant leave to amend the pleading in ruling on a motion for summary judgment? Everybody understand the question? Obviously, you can only base the MSJ or MSA on the operative complaint or cross-complaint. Can the court 
in ruling, in essence, treat it as a motion for judgment on the pleadings and grant leave to amend. Yes, the court can do that, or no, the court cannot grant leave to amend the pleading. We have a pretty even split running here, Judge Carlin. Um, the yeses are creeping up at 51%, and the noes are at 49, a real debacle. Okay. It's, the answer, everybody, is yes. Court can do it. Summary. Oh, okay. What is required for a continuance of a uh, of an opposition um, to a uh, motion for summary judgment? That would be under 437 CH. And you can see the party moving for a continuance must show facts essential to justify opposition may exist. Um, here's just my practical thought because I dealt with this a lot. And I actually had one go up on appeal on me where I declined to allow a continuance. Um, I rarely, if ever, would decline to allow a continuance. Um, it, it would have to be so extreme for me to do that. In most cases, uh, take a med mal case. If you're a plaintiff and you've filed your med mal case, hopefully you've already consulted with an expert who can tell you that the physician's conduct fell below the standard of care. All you need is to put your expert on and you pretty much guarantee a denial of the motion for summary judgment. So uh, when I see these, I have to get a continuance, I have to do more discovery. Sometimes I just can't figure out why, because you can easily um, raise a tribal issue of material fact. But I think you should do both. That would be the advice is, is Make your timely request. Remember, it has to be timely. And a lot of time, um, people will wait until after the opposition is due. They'll show up ex party in the courtroom two days before the hearing. Um, the statute tells you when you have to bring the 437 CH motion. So please be mindful of that. Next slide. Um, I believe you may have had an extra answer or an extra question you wanted to put in here. Did I miss it? What was the question? Um, about motions to consolidate. No, Am we'll I... do it later. Oh, okay. Did I miss it? No, we'll, we'll do it later. Um, so just remember, don't solely rely on a request for continuance as your sole ground for your opposition. Um, I, I would seek relief by ex parte application well before your opposition is due so you can raise substantive grounds if your continuance request is denied. Like I said, you should be able to defeat if you have the right ducks in place. Next slide. Even if properly formatted, this is back to those MSJ objections. Even if properly formatted, the court is not required to rule on all objections asserted in conjunction with a summary judgment or summary adjudication motion. Everybody understand the question? True or false, even if properly formatted. When I was still wearing that black robe, I didn't have to rule on all the objections. Is that true or false? Yes, judge. If I do it correctly, you have to do it correctly. You have to rule on everything. What are your thoughts? We are a real even split here, 50-50, though it looks like the falses are moving ahead by just a little bit. Okay, and the answer is true. Court only has to rule on those objections to evidence that it deems material to its disposition of the motion. That was one of the great, great changes in the law for judges. Next slide. Determinations of good faith settlement, really important. I'm going to um, suggest to you that someone like me who does um, mostly mediations, you need to make sure that you um, address these properly in court. Um, what I've seen a couple of times is the 
is the party who could sell the case is the one who's now gone because of a good faith determination. So be really mindful of that, number one. Um, number two, let's move. Remember, there are two ways to do this. 877.6A1 and 877.6A2. I've never quite understood why parties don't go the A2 route because let it sit for 20 days or 25 based on service and see how it plays out. Um, then it gets granted. Otherwise, in my courtroom, I wasn't even hearing them before 20 or 25 days. And if the 20 or 25 days lapsed, I didn't set them six months out. I would get them set as quickly as possible. Um, just be aware of those two sections. Next. Be aware of the tech belt factors in analyzing um, whether or not the settlement is in good faith. Most of you are aware of that. Let's skip forward because we are running out of time. Does a determination of good faith settlement bind all other tort feasors, even those who are not parties? Your client has settled. The court has found the settlement is in good faith. Signed the order. Does that mean your client is released for all time in perpetuity against everyone, even non-party tort feasors? Yes or no? We have some figures here. The yeses have 42% and the noes have 58%. Excellent. And the answer, nope. Good faith determination is not binding on non-party joint tort feasors whose relationship to the subject matter plaintiff's claim was known or reasonably should have been known to the settling parties and which was excuse me, blah, blah, which was joined in a tort action after the 877-6 settlement determination. What that says and what I have always found to be the case is anyone you know of, even if they're not in the case, give notice to them. And then what's going to happen practically is they're going to come in and ask to conduct discovery. Um, and what I have done when that has happened is I've granted reasonable but limited discovery to allow them to properly defend, even though they're not parties. Um, next slide, but make sure you give notice if you want them to be covered. Motion for sanctions, 128.5 and 128.7. Uh, 128.5, just frivolous bad faith conduct solely intended to cause unnecessary delay. Does not, cannot be used for discovery abuses, misuses. 128.7 is for all the pleading paperwork nonsense. Um, let's go to the next slide. Remember the safe harbor provision for 128.7 and for anything under 128.5 that relates basically to writings. Remember, you got to first serve it on the offending party and then give them the 21 days to withdraw that safe harbor waiting period. And then at the end of the waiting party, if the pleading is not withdrawn, then you can file the motion. Strict compliance is mandated. So just be aware of this two-step two -step procedure. Next slide. Motions in limine. Um, I love motions in limine. When I was a brand new judge, I remember my first jury trial. I remember where I was sitting in my chambers and I remember that there were piles of motions. I, they, they were completely unorganized. So I put... Plaintiff's motion eliminated one here. I put the moving opposition reply in a stack. And I did that one through 30. And then I went to defendants and I did one through 42. And my whole floor was like something out of uh, one of these movies where it, it was like a maze. And, um, and I put it all together and I read everything. And that Monday when I came into the courtroom and I could barely see and when the light in the courtroom shined in my eyes, and of course the courtroom wasn't that bright, but I had read everything. And I remember the lawyers greeted me with the biggest smile. Judge, you're not going to believe it. We've got great news. We just settled. And I looked at my clerk and said, bring the jurors down. And the lawyers looked at me confused and said, we settled. I said, I can't let you do that. I just read 72 motions in limine. We're going to go to trial. Now, of course, I was joking. We didn't go to trial. We didn't bring the jurors down. But what I learned from that is I didn't read motions in limine then until the last minute because it 
took a lot of time and effort and many of these cases, if not most settle. Um, so just be aware in your motion limiting of a couple things. One, the motions that ask me to follow and apply the hearsay rule, you probably shouldn't be bringing. If the court doesn't know what the hearsay rule is or how to follow it or, or to follow it, you have bigger problems. Um, you can see Kelly versus New West Federal Savings, matters of day-to-day -day trial logistics and common professional courtesy should not be the subject of motions and limity. Um, really focus on what's, what matters. They can be very important, but the most important from a judicial standpoint is organize them for the court. Most of the local rules require it, but moving opposition reply together under exhibit one tab. Um, some people like to do A, B, C, D, E, so it's moving as A, then B, then C. By the time I get to or get to motion in limine six, I was at triple L or something. I had no idea where anything was. My preference, and I think most rules in the courtrooms follow this, is exhibit tab one is motion limine one and it's moving opposition reply, then you go to two. I loved it that way, so just something to think about. Next slide. Okay, um, a lot of motions here to be relieved, notice related cases, motions to expunge, et cetera. Here, I'm gonna ask you a question. This was one of the ones that would come up almost every week, every other week in my courtroom. Can you consolidate cases that are not related Katie, can you let them ask, answer that question? Can you consolidate cases that are not related? And I believe this is our last question. So everybody get your votes in if you want to participate today. Okay, last question. It's not to say we're done. We still have a lot of ground to cover on argument. Can you consolidate cases? This should be 100%. We are getting uh, the yeses sitting at 28% and the noes sitting at 72%. Okay, so okay, so let's let's call it and I'm gonna tell you it was a trick question. I apologize for the last question being kind of a trick question. The answer is, and it, it's a trick question because under LA Superior Court rules, under LA Superior Court rules, you cannot consolidate cases that are not related unless they are, are already in the same department. So technically the answer was yes, but I don't think those of you who said yes thought that that was the answer. What I used to get all the time was cases floating around the county and um, someone brought a motion to consolidate. I would just deny it and say they have to be related first. I always gave a reason. If they're all in my, if they're all in my courtroom but not related, then yes, technically they don't have to be related because they're already in front of me. Just a little twist on that that rule. But those of you who said no, yes, I agree with that generally speaking because it's very rare that you have all the cases in the same courtroom. You might as well just go ask the judge what you're going to do. Um, everybody follow that. So check your local rules in LA County. They have to be either in the same courtroom or already related. Okay, next slide. Oh, hold on. Hold on, I am having technical, give me one second, I got dropped. There we go. Okay, so let's move on. Oh, motion for attorney's fees. I'm gonna speak real quickly on this. <laughs> what would be great for judges is if you also provided a breakdown. Oftentimes I would get hundreds of pages of billing statements that spanned years and had lots of blackouts. I always loved it when someone would said, and here in addition is my declaration. And it says for the demur, I spent X hours and it cost me this much per hour. And this is what I'm total charging for demur or, or, or for filing for pleading um, for for the motion for summary judgment, for this, for that, for discovery. It, it makes it really simple so the court can understand exactly what you did and why the fees that you're putting forward are appropriate. And by presenting them in a manner that way, you show so much to the court, so much respect. My hunch is you're more likely to get them, um, at least most of them. Next slide. <clears throat> okay, common pitfalls and briefs. Next slide. 
So a day in the life. I'm going to tell you real quickly. In 2009, 2010, when I first went into an IC court, I had about 350 cases. I look back at my stats. When I hit the peak in 2021, 2022, I was at 730 cases. In 2009, 2010, of the 350 cases, one half were business disputes, or I should say non-PI cases, one half were PI cases. The personal in injury cases do not have a ton of law in motion. They tend to just go to trial or settle. In 2022, the 730 cases I had were almost all hotly litigated law in motion, non-PI cases. Today, I just checked, they're up to a thousand cases in the West District. So I want you to understand the volume they're dealing with. In addition, never forget the judges are just like everybody else. You all have the same issues we do, although we wear the black robe and we try um, to put on the stiff upper lip or so to speak. We try to um, never show it. But just like you have illnesses that you deal with, you have family members who have illnesses, you take care of your aging parents, you might have a pet who's sick, um, a child who's whatever the issue, good, bad, or, or whatever car accidents. There, there's a million things that go on in your lives. Remember, they go on in our lives too. And so the better you can get this, the you know, the cleaner, the better it is for everyone. So let's go forward. <laughs> These are the great choices. Lead with your best argument. I can't tell you how many times people have buried, hold on, people have buried their best argument on the 12th page. Lead with it. Help me help you. Next. Do not use every page allocated to you just because you can. Next. Own the, own, own the weaknesses in your position on issues. I say this all the time. Own it. If it's a weakness, deal with it. Focus on why you have the winning or at least the better position. Next. A well-written brief will get my attention or at least the current judges. Next. For complex notions, it's always great to provide hard copies of exhibits. Um, not just electronic. It helps the judge to go through it, a hard copy. Next. Include an appropriate discussion of facts and procedural history. Don't think because you know the case so well that the judge will remember everything. Um, judge has lots of cases. As I said, they're up to a thousand now, and I'm sure it's everywhere like that in the state. Next. Uh, sanctions request a realistic amount, not some crazy amount. Next. Four choices. Let's go through them. Not following formatting rules it makes it hard to read. Next. Um, yes, you just have to have, you have to follow the correct separate statement rules. Next. Run on sentences and paragraphs. I've had paragraphs that are, or sentences that are, are three pages. Paragraphs that run on and on. Uh, referencing other filings without including them, that is hugely problematic. Next. Uh, obviously, I, do I even need to mention this? Next. Uh, vitriol and nastiness. Um, I don't know a single judge who appreciates that. Next. And by the way, we can figure out what's going on. Uh, yeah, probably good to spell our names right. It, it's, you know, it, it is what it is. Next. Oh, this is my favorite. Katie, next page. This is what some people think it looks like or that it looks good, that I'm I'm hammering home, I'm reading. I'm, imagine reading that times a thousand. It's, it's not just Tylenol that you would need. You would need something far stronger. Okay, next. Got a couple minutes left, let me finish. Now that you've submitted an amazing brief, next. Do not snatch defeat from the jaws of victory by making a mistake during oral argument. And so to conclude, go ahead, Katie. The good and the bad and the ugly when it comes to oral, oral argument. And to be honest, does it even matter? People ask me all the time, do I really like, is my argument matter? Why am I doing this? I feel like the judge already made up uh, judge's mind. It does matter. I promise you, I promise you it matters, um, especially in the close calls. Um, keep going, keep going, keep going. Next one. Okay, so ineffective. When you talk over each other, it's ineffective. Be calm. 
Next, uh, if you just regurgitate or repeat what's in your brief, not the most effective tactic. Next. Here's my favorite. Asking the judge if she read your brief or if I read your brief. Make sure, and in fact, what usually happens is I will say to someone, well, on page seven of your brief, you said such and such. No, I didn't say that. Yes, you did. I didn't say that. Do you have your brief handy? Can you pull it out? Oh, I, I, I didn't bring it with me. You want me to print you a copy. And lo and behold, on page seven, it was said exactly as I said it. So just, just be aware. And it, it really doesn't gain you points. If I didn't read your brief, there's a reason. Usually I didn't get it. And I will tell you, counsel, I didn't get a brief. Did you file it? Did we miss it? Do you want me to take a break and read it? Or do you want me to, or do you want to argue? And then I'll read it. And then we'll come back. You tell me. Next one. Oh yeah. Arguing with the judge doesn't usually go over well. Much better to say, I see your concern or I see your point, but what about this? Next. So my, I used to ask people on tough cases, what's the case on point or am I creating new law? Tell me the case on point. And 75% of the time, the case that I was given wasn't on point. It's great if you have a case on point. If you don't, it's great if you say, I don't have one on point, this is the closest. Next. Uh, if the court interrupts you to ask a question, it probably should be a signal to you that it really is important to the court. Run with it. Don't get mad. Don't ignore it. Next. Um, yeah, having to get the last word in is a problem. I've had hearings where I've watched them go back and forth. And what it really tells me is if this gets to trial, I'm setting time limits because there is no value in getting the last word in. Next. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. Telling the judge to stop interrupting you. Um, I've heard that's happened before to, to judges. Next one. We'll finish up with slide. Next one. I think we have one more. Here's the good. And then we'll wrap it up. This is it. Um, Your Honor, everything I would argue is already in my moving oppo reply brief. Is there any issue you would like me to address or expound upon? Expound upon. Otherwise, I'll defer to opposing counsel and reserve my right to respond. Um, if that would be okay. You know what my answer would be? Hell yes. I mean, that would be my answer today. On the bench, I would say yes, counsel. I would appreciate that. Thank you very much. Today, hell yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, be pinpoint precise and efficient. Less truly is more. Next. Avoid repeating the same points over and over and over again. If your judge doesn't get it the first time or the second time or the third time, we got problems. Next. Uh, again, as I said, concede when there's no case on point. You're, just tell the court, you're going to have to make some law. Courts usually don't shy away. That's, that's kind of cool. Next. Be prepared. Know your facts and know the law inside and out. And finally, if the motion is really important, I would do everything you can to be in court. It really is better to be uh, in court. You can read the judge better. The judge can read you better. Um, just my two cents. Is that it, Katie? Yep, that is it for us here. Um, we unfortunately don't have any time for questions this afternoon, um, but that was, uh, Hayward wanted to make a point before we conclude this afternoon though. So Yeah, so thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Judge Carlin. And thank you, everybody, for your patience. I know we're a few minutes late. Uh, I know there's been a lot of questions as to whether Judge Carlin will be distributing his live slide deck. Uh, that will be included in the email uh, where we send the certificate of attendance, uh, which will be sent out to everybody uh, by end of tomorrow. So you can you, you will receive a copy. ADR Services, Inc. has been your unwavering partner in alternative dispute resolution. But as the world changed, so did we. From virtual and hybrid hearings to our ongoing on-demand CLE program, ADR Services, Inc. continues to keep resolution and legal education at the forefront, woman-owned and operated from the start. There is someone for every situation. We are ADR Services, Inc.